Good morning. I'm Brian Holler, and uh, again, so glad that uh, you could come out and we could uh, gather together on this day and just uh, uh, wherever you are, wherever you are in your journey, whether, whether you are a cradle Christian, which means you were born into a Christian family and, and grew up as a Christian and, and you have always put your faith in Jesus Christ, and, or whether you uh, have walked through the doors of the church for the first time in your life today, uh, just wanting to know what this is all about. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're on this journey with us. And uh, we're, we're glad that uh, we can just share some of this good news with you today. And so, again, uh, glad that everyone is here. I want to start uh, with um, a comment that Stephen Wright made. You all know who Stephen Wright is? He's a very dry comedian. He said he wishes that the very first word that he had ever spoke was, quote, and then right before he died, he wanted to say, unquote. <laughs> now, our, uh, our last words, uh, so many times in history, uh, we've recorded the last words of people. And sometimes the last words are not things that they would probably be proud of that they were recorded in, in history. One of those things, you know, P.T. Barnum, the, the last thing P.T. Barnum was recorded as ever saying is, how are the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? Uh, Humphrey Bogart, the last thing he ever said was, uh, I should have never switched from scotch to martinis. <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. Uh, Winston Churchill is, is uh, noted as saying, I'm bored with it all. His last words. Uh, Lou Costello in typical Lou Costello fashion, the last thing he said was, uh, that was the best ice cream soda I've ever tasted. <laughs> and then there are some people who uh, realize that this is a big moment, and, and, and these are possibly their last words, and they don't know what to say. Uh, Pancho Villa, who's a Mexican revolutionary, he said, uh, don't let it in like this. Tell them I said something. <laughs> Now, those are uh, some of those last words that maybe uh, people weren't too proud of that uh, got recorded in history, and, uh, but there are others who have uh, taken that last breath and, and used it as a, a great opportunity and, and things that they could be proud of that were recorded in history. John Wesley, with some of his dying breaths, he sang the, praises, uh, the praise song. He sang, uh, I'll praise my maker while I have breath. Some of the last words that he had sang or said. Uh, Martin Luther, the last thing he said is, Our God is the God from whom cometh salvation. God is the Lord by whom we escape death. And then Samuel Rutherford said, Mine eye shall see my Redeemer. He has pardoned, loved, and washed me, and given me joy unspeakable and full of glory. Glory shines in Emmanuel's land. So there are uh, some beautiful uh, opportunities, or beautiful sayings from people in those last breaths, those dying breaths, and, and thankful we have some of those recorded. Uh, if you'll join me, we'll uh, say a prayer as we continue. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you've uh, brought us together this morning, that you've given us an opportunity to, uh, to see the truth of who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. And I pray that, that we, can, uh, we can allow that to sink into us this morning. Uh, as we talk about the cross, that we could uh, get a grasp of, of, of what it is that you've done for us and, and what was it that was going through your mind in those final hours. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that it becomes uh, transformational to us, that we allow it to uh, to change our lives, uh, regardless uh, of, of where we've been in our faith and our belief with you up to this point, that we uh, allow it to, to change our lives, to conform us to more to the person of who you are. And uh, Lord, again, as always, I, I more than ever, with the message of the cross today, I would pray that, uh, that, that my words, that you make them clear, that this is, this is your holy ground, Lord, that you would take it and, and you would uh, just bring clarity uh, to, to any words that come out of my mouth, Lord, and, and have them touch hearts and minds. I thank you and pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're coming to the end of a series that uh, we've been talking about this final week uh, that Jesus spent in his public ministry. And 
we've we're in week five. Uh, we've talked about how this beginning of this week starts, and it starts with this idea of of searching out the leaven in in your life, and and leaven has always been a picture of sin, and so there's an idea of of, of finding the sin in your life, and, and searching every nook and cranny, and sometimes it's it's as plain as a nose on our face, the sin that's in our life, and things that we need to address, and and uh, just preparing our hearts to come before God and come before the cross uh, in this final week. And then we talked about a, a communion and, and how, again, that Passover meal was uh, what we do as communion under the Lord's Supper. It's this abbreviated version of this Seder and how it pictures all that Christ has done for us. Uh, we talked to how that Jesus then went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples and, and talked about temptation and uh, how they were going to have to face these temptations in their life. And, and then Jesus faced the six trials and talked about the conviction that he received from uh, these trials, but more than that, the conviction that Jesus had in order to go to the cross and the conviction he calls us to, to be his followers. And then last week we talked about how uh, to come before the cross, we need to come broken. We need to take all of that we've done in this past week uh, leading up to this and come before the cross broken and so that we can give it to Christ and he can crucify it. So today... We come to this, this centerpiece of the cross. And, and so much centers around this one event, this one symbol. You know, Christianity, we've adopted this symbol here just to say that, that we're Christians. And this is a, pretty much a universal thing. If we see this symbol, we associate that with Christianity. All of Christianity focuses upon what happened on this cross. But it doesn't end there. And, and I want to make sure that we understand that. And we'll talk more about that next week. And so while we're talking about this, don't think that this is the end. Because that isn't the end. Now, historically speaking, we can talk about Jesus, and there's a lot of debate about uh, different aspects of Jesus, but anybody uh, who is um, a sound student of history knows, whether you believe in that Jesus was the Son of God or not, that Jesus existed. Jesus was a real person, and, and history tells us that Jesus died on a cross. And this isn't just the Bible that tells us this. We have history books that tell us this. I want to read to you a, a short excerpt from uh, Josephus. He was a, a Jewish historian, and he wrote uh, a book called The Antiquity of the Jews. And so here's his account in mentioning uh, the historic event that Jesus was crucified. It said, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to this day. Now that's history that's not from Scripture. Okay, the, the, the historicity the, uh, of Jesus as the person, a man who was crucified on the cross that's been attested to in many different things other than Scripture. And so that's not something that we need to necessarily debate. And in the process of crucifixion, a lot of us have heard all about this and we've seen graphic uh, demonstrations of it in, in theater and in movies and but it comes down to taking a, a human being and laying him on this cross and running a nail or a spike through their wrists between the bones of their forearms as they stretch them out and running it through their wrists because that supports the weight and then running a, a spike through both feet as you overlap them into the wood to hold them to this, this beam. And then they stand it upright. Now the process of death, and this was, this was, this was a torture device, the, the goal of this was no one comes off of this alive. The process of death was a process of suffocation. It wasn't blood loss or 
or anything else. It was because being stretched out in that position, the, the, uh, the victim couldn't breathe. And eventually, tiring from pulling themselves up on these spikes that are driven through their arms and their feet, they suffocated. That's the process of the crucifixion. We have a, a theological aspect, idea, which is what eternity hinges on. Eternity hinges upon the fact that Jesus is God. That He's sinless. He's never done anything wrong. He's perfect. And He took upon Himself all the failures and the sins and, and, and the wounds and the hurts that every one of us have and still have and have ever had. Jesus is the only perfect sacrifice who took all of that upon Himself and a punishment, a justice, that, the justice that needed to be served. Jesus said, I'll pay that price. And so He hung on the cross to take all of that and let it die on the cross. And, and that's so important to understand. And, 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 and I fear that as many Christians, many Christians don't understand the importance of that. That Jesus died for that reason. This morning I want to delve a little bit into the personal aspect of the crucifixion. Because we, we do, we talk about the theological and that is, that, is, that is vitally, that is paramount importance. But we forget that there was a man who hung on the cross. That for several hours there was a man who was nailed to this piece of wood. And I want to look at what went through his mind in those hours. Jesus said seven statements while he hung on the cross. And I'm going to look at those statements. I'm going to look at who Jesus in those final hours talked to. What was on his heart? What did he share with the people around him? And, and is now in Scripture for us to know. Again, he made seven statements. And if we take the Gospels and we put them together, we can see what those seven statements are. And we saw them here a moment ago on the screen. And it starts... With Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In Luke chapter 23, it says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You have Jesus in this moment, in this, this, this dire moment, in this moment of his death, and he's facing this, this horrible crucifixion, and the first thing on his mind is to go to the Father. Take all of his, all of his concerns and his thoughts to the Father. This is one of the things that I, I think that, that we uh, can, can see and learn a lesson from in that, that when whatever comes at us, whatever comes at us in life, whether it's a, a good thing that we want to give praise for, we should go to the Father first and say, Lord, thank you for this. Recognize that He's the one and the giver of all good things. If it's something bad, something harmful, something that causes us pain, then turn and go to the Father and ask Him. Lord, please, please help me with this. Help me see what's coming from this. Help me learn, if there's something to learn through this, help me with, to see what that is. If there's, if there's something I need to change, help me with that, Lord. Or if it's just comfort I need, Lord, I come to you for that comfort. And there, there's, an, there's a trust issue. There's a trust issue because, again, we've said a lot of, over these past, this past year that, you know, do you believe in God? Okay, many of us say, yes, we believe in God. But do you believe God? Do you believe what He says? And if God says you can come to Him with anything, do we trust Him with that? Do we believe that? Do we take to Him everything first? Go to, go to God first. Go to the Father first. And then he, when he goes to the Father, he goes with this idea of forgiveness on his heart. And, and this is 
This is almost simultaneous as, as men are driving spikes through his flesh. He's asking for forgiveness for them. He's seeking forgiveness despite the fact that he did nothing wrong. Despite the fact that he is perfect. Despite the fact that he is God and if he had wanted to, he could have in that moment called down the powers of heaven upon those people and lifted himself off of that cross. Instead, he went to the Father and he asked forgiveness for those people. It didn't matter at that moment that, that Jesus was right. He went and, and, and at those those guards were wrong. He went to the Father on their behalf and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And forgiveness is just, it, it, it's so much about the cross, so much about what we find at the cross. And, and, it, and it's, it's such a need in this world. C.S. Lewis says, Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And we do that. We, we say, yes, as Christians, we should. We should forgive and we should, we should give it out in, 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 in abundance until someone wrongs us. Until we receive that wound. Until we know that we're right and they're wrong. But it's in this instance when Jesus asks, us, asks forgiveness for them. second statement that Jesus makes from the cross. He says, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This comes out of, again, Luke. It says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. The other criminal rebuked the first criminal. He says, Don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. We have such a debt of gratitude to this criminal who hung on the cross. Because... Whenever we talk about what is it that makes us a Christian, what is it that earns us an opportunity, a place in heaven, this criminal makes it abundantly clear that it's not about us. It's not what you do. This criminal hung on a cross next to Jesus. He was, he was nailed to a cross. He couldn't move his arms. He couldn't move his legs. He couldn't come down from the cross. And in that moment of repentance, Jesus turned to him and said, Now you have a place in heaven. Not because of anything you did. You couldn't do anything. We needed a man nailed to a cross with inability to do anything to earn himself to prove to us and show to us that that's not what heaven's about. It's not about your good deeds. It's not about you being a, a good person. It's about putting your faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done. It's about accepting the payment that Jesus made on that cross for us. And that's exactly what this repentant sinner did. And so we owe him this enormous debt of gratitude that we will always be able to look at this sinner, this, this criminal on this cross and say, it is by Jesus and Jesus alone. Not my works. There's a reassurance there. Jesus, as he hung on the cross himself, he looked to others and he said, I want you to be reassured. I want you to know you have a place. I want you to find that peace regardless of your circumstances. A criminal dying on a cross. Jesus says, I want you to have that peace of where you'll be. And it's paradise. And it's paradise. And not just paradise, but paradise with Jesus. The third statement he makes is he looks at his mother because... His mother had gathered there at the cross. He says, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. And if we look into the book of John, chapter 19, it says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby and the disciple whom Jesus loved was John, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. 
And from that time on, this disciple, this disciple took her into his home. This is... Uh, I never thought a whole lot about this statement, but this is Jesus in these dying moments saying, listen, we need to break down barriers between what is family and what are the family of God. We need to take discipleship and family and we need to merge them into one. And where we have disciples and followers of Christ, they are now family. And where we have family, we need to make them family disciples. We need to take and, and, and stop taking our faith and putting it into the four walls like we've been talking about, and say it needs to infiltrate and, and, and run through every aspect of our lives. So those in our family, we should, we should share the love of Christ with them. They aren't excluded. They aren't excluded from the forgiveness, from the love, from the caring. Even though those in our family are some of the ones who have hurt us the most, that's the greatest opportunity for us to, to practice the patience and the love of Christ. And those disciples, the people that we gather together with, like we do here on Sunday mornings, that we all call ourselves the body of Christ, we need to understand that this is a bond that isn't like, hey, how are you doing on Sunday morning, and not caring what the answer is. But this is a bond where we should love and care and concern for one another. And we should look to one another for, for guidance and reassurance and, and help during hard times and rejoice during wonderful times. We should meld those two ideas of disciple and family as Jesus did with his disciple John and his mother. Then Jesus turned and in his final moments Jesus cried out. He said he cried out with a loud voice. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This comes out of the book of Mark. Mark shares with us, it says, At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a sometimes a difficult passage to understand of why Jesus, who's God, hanging on a cross, would look to the Father and say, why have you forsaken me? And there's so much that goes into this one little statement. Because we see that in a moment of despair, in a moment of loneliness, in a moment of, of, of fear, that again Jesus turns to God. Turns to the Father. And uh, Jesus is feeling alone at this point. He's feeling forsaken. He's feeling like, God, you're not with me. And, and, in, a, and, and in a sense, we look at all the, the physical torture that Jesus went through from the cross and the, and the thorn and the, and the beatings that he took and the nails, and we think how horrible that is. But, but the moment that God, for a moment, turned his back on his son because he took the sin of the world upon him, there's more harm and pain done in that spiritual ripping of flesh than we would ever witness or see or imagine in the physical ripping of flesh from the crucifixion. So there's a very, very real moment there where, where God says He's become sin on our behalf and He turns His back on Him and Jesus experiences that and He feels that and, and He cries out, Here's the, the one thing that we did, some of us may not understand is that when Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the first line of Psalm 22. And if you've never read the 22nd Psalm, it's a beautiful psalm. Because it starts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it goes through and in, in a very prophetic fashion. It tells about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Just a couple of lines from Psalm 22. It says, For dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. We said last week at the scourging, Many times it laid bare the, the bones of the ribs where you can see the bones. They can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. This was hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was crucified. 
he was not despised, for he has not despised, talking about God, he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried out to him for help, he heard. This is the good news of what Jesus cried out. And when he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because 22nd Psalm plays the whole thing out. You see that God never left. That God is there. And even in those times when we're feeling alone and we're feeling uh, like God has forsaken us, God hasn't left us. It says, The afflicted will eat and be satisfied, and those who seek Him will praise the Lord and let your heart live forever. That's the message of Jesus' call. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a, it's a call and an understanding and a relating that you and I know and we can feel the pain. But that God doesn't leave us. God is always there for us. After he cries that out, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. In the book of John it says later, knowing that everything had been, now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, but the sponge on the stalk of a high salt plant, they lifted it to Jesus' lips. Jesus said this. He didn't call it out to anyone in, in, in particular. He didn't address it to anyone. He just said, I am thirsty. This was a call for us to fulfill needs. When there are needs to be met, it's a call for us to step forward as Christians and, and, and followers of Christ to fulfill needs. And in this moment, when Jesus has taken on all of our sin, all of the sin of the world, he takes upon our needs as well. Knowing that we are a people, a mankind that is in need. We thirst. We thirst so much for what God has to offer us. He tells us in Matthew, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If we thirst for, for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. And it's through this cross that we receive that, satisfa this, that satisfaction. And Jesus said, it is finished. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And this is a, a statement. You don't finish something unless he came to start something. He came with a purpose. And the cross was part of that purpose. And so when Jesus shows up and he says, it's finished, that means what he came to do, he accomplished it. He did it. So he didn't come down to earth just to show his face and pat some somebody on the back. He came with the purpose of taking our sins and dying. He came with the purpose of, of killing our brokenness. And he, he proclaims from the cross, it's finished. He did that. He accomplished that. He came to, to offer abundant life and he did it. He came to offer healing came to offer freedom. He came for the purpose of giving us truth. He came to give us a knowledge of God. And not just a knowledge of God, but a relationship with God. And not just a temporary relationship with God, but an eternal relationship with God. In heaven. He said, I came so that the lost might be saved. And when he hung on the cross, he said, it's finished. He did that. He was committed to his purpose and his goal regardless of what that cost was to accomplish it. Regardless of the opposition, regardless of the pain, regardless of the unpopularity, to his last breath, he went with his purpose. And it's a call to us, and that's, that's that conviction that we were talking about. Conviction for the purpose of, of being Christ-like. The final statement that Jesus made from the cross is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Again, Luke 23 says, It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And we had said this. He breathed his last. Again, we see where Jesus began by turning to God, turning to the Father. And saying, Father, I know I need your comfort and your strength to get through this. And when it was completed and done, he again turned to the Father. We see that at the very beginning in creation, that 
that God worked through the Son and the Holy Spirit to, to create. And they said in the very first book of the Bible, let us make man in our image. Together they accomplished that. And somewhere along the line, in Genesis very early, that was torn. And so we see again the Father working with the Son to bring us back to that image of God that union with God. And we see the Holy Spirit working upon our hearts to couple us with that. This cross has for over this past 2,000 years it's become a symbol. There's so much that is, that is encompassed in this simple figure. So much truth that comes out of this. So much that, that we just struggle to understand everything that goes into this cross. For 2,000 years, this is, this is the best way that we can surmise all that God has done for us. All that Jesus came to do for us. We look at this and this is the best thing that we can do to say, this is what He did for us. And again, this wasn't a surprise. Jesus was born. He took on human flesh. He came for this reason. He knew He was coming to the cross. It wasn't the Romans that condemned Him to the cross. It wasn't the Jews that condemned Him to the cross. It wasn't the nails that held Him to the cross. Jesus went to the cross. It's been said that if He had to nail Himself to the cross, then He would have. But understand He did it for you and I. And I want to take uh, just a moment of meditation this morning. And as we end up, I want, I want to take this time and I want you to think about all the things that were going through, through Jesus' mind as He hung on this cross in those last hours as, as the God-man hung on this cross for you and I, for our brokenness, for our sins, for, for our weaknesses, for our failures, for all of those things that haunt us and that we struggle with. And, and all of our, our moral issues that we're dealing with, and, and all of those things, the wounds, all of those things, in the context of what, what Jesus was thinking about on the cross, God the Father, and, and, and family, and fellow Christians, and the repentant sinner, and the purpose of our life, I want you to think about that. Judy, I want to I ask you to just, just play something. Can you do that while we... And I want to invite you. I want to invite you to make this your own because in the Old Testament, when, when, when you gave a sacrifice and you had to put your hand on top of that lamb and you needed to say, this should be me. This should be me. I know this should be me. But this lamb has taken my place. And then they would you put your hand on that lamb's head as they slit the throat of that lamb. All the while knowing this should be me. So I want to invite you this morning. If you'd like to make this very personal and understand that this cross was for you and I. This should be me. There's hammers and there's nails. I invite you to come forward as you think about those things that you want nailed to the cross and put a nail on the cross. The understanding that He did it for you.
Great Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, help us to never forget that what this sacrifice was for, it was for you or for, 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 for the people gathered here, for me, for, for all of us, for each one of us individually, Lord, that, that we not forget that what you did, you did it for me. That it should have been me. That because you paid the price, because you've, you've, you've satisfied justice, because of that, we can spend an eternity with you in heaven. So Lord, as we, we think about these nails that we've driven in here, and, and the things that, that they represent, Lord, I pray that we leave them on the cross and that they die. You took them there to die. So Lord, I, I thank you for that. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for in the midst of who you are, what you did for us. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.